Good morning, everybody, uh, both those of you who are in attendance here and those online. Uh, my name is Zahir Kalik. I'm the chair of the UK group in the Institute, and it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Claire Hanna, uh, the SDLP MP for South Belfast. Uh, prior to that, uh, she represented South Belfast in the Assembly and before that on Belfast City Council. Um, she's very prominent in the SDLP. Uh, it's difficult to turn on Northern Ireland television without sometimes seeing Claire on the television. And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here, Claire, and to talk about reconciliation and the future of Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. I really stand if that's okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for um, the invitation. And I think, uh, and I hope, um, You'll agree that for the last um, decades, the SDLP has very genuinely and in good faith given priority to, to reconciliation, to the economy um, and to, to good government. We believe and, and believed always very, very extensively and deeply in the values of uh, 1998 and, and that the Good Friday Agreement um, meant that we needed less nationalism and, and not more. But I'm hoping to set out to you today our belief um, that the same values and those same principles that have driven the SDLP um, for 50 years now lead us to, to very strongly assert that a, that a fresh process for a new Ireland is the way to achieve those goals, is the way that we can um, get towards reconciliation and, and uh, prosperity. Those of us who do want to change um, in the North, we know uh, that we those of us who want a new Ireland, an inclusive new Ireland, a new Ireland um, back in in the EU, we, we do have an obligation to spell out exactly what we uh, mean and to put flesh on the bones of what we're lazily and glossily calling the conversation um, at the moment. We have to start explaining what a new constitutional arrangement for the island might look like and crucially how uh, we're going to get there. We know that we also have to look and talk and explain how we broach the subject in, of change in a region that hasn't traditionally been very good uh, at listening to each other, how we talk to each other um, as people and not merely as representatives of traditions or tribes, how we move the conversation beyond this does your unionist friend take sugar phase that we're in um, at the moment, making um, lazy assumptions about people's um, beliefs. We know that the journey to the, to the New Ireland we're, we're trying to create, uh, understandably, prompts more anxiety than the destination itself. And, and recent surveys have indicated that some 60% of people uh, in the South and 68 in the North say that they fear the prospect of Irish unity could spark a return to violence. Former DUP MLA, current DUP councillor uh, Sammy Douglas in, in uh, a book by Susan McKay from 2022 captures that uh, point very well. He said, I don't fear a united Ireland, but I do fear the 10 years leading up to it. But it is a fact that the stalemate and the stagnation in the north is very, very uh, much injecting dynamism into that conversation and driving interest in a new constitutional future. Um, for our party through our New Ireland Commission, initially through um, over a few years, quiet conversations, the sort of multiple levels of dialogue that led to the Good Friday Agreement. We've been trying to deepen that, that conversation and to, to draw out some of the concerns and the thoughts that people have about how this might go. I know that the headline and the easy line is that unionists won't engage, but that's not what we're finding. Um, in those meetings, some of them private and some of them not, we're finding questions questions, of course, but we're finding open minds as well. We're finding people who can read current events, who can think about the future and what it means for them, uh, for their businesses, for, for their kids. Um, at a public event uh, we we hosted in early September um, when Matthew O'Toole uh, set out a lot of the thinking that I'm going to, to, to talk about today, the majority of the questions and good, serious questions came from people of a unionist background who are at various points on the, uh, on the unity curious scale. Um, like us, many feel that it is entirely rational and fair to, to start to explore what our options are here, particularly when, and I love this to change, but um, the optimism of the last few weeks is fading, but particularly when even the status quo of devolution within the UK isn't available to people um, in the North. 
And many are beginning to agree with us that, in fact, exploring these issues and exploring a New Ireland can be the driver of reconciliation and good government and not just a project that can only be embarked on after those aims are achieved. So many do and many don't share our serious and considered view that the three core divisions that are thwarting the North's potential in their sectarianism, inequality and partition need to be tackled together and not just in sequence, which is maybe the way many have approached it before. We know this isn't any sort of a quick fix to the very um, demoralizing stalemate we find ourselves in, and it isn't a knee-jerk uh, response to it either. Um, we've thought about this very, very deeply over these last uh, challenging years, and we also know that there are more questions than there are answer, but we're answers, but we're, we're very serious about answering them, about ask, answering what we mean when we say in New Ireland, what do we mean when we say inclusive? Who do we mean when we talk about Ireland? To help explain, we've published uh, six, a document with six principles, which will guide uh, our engagements on this and which I'd like to set out uh, to you this morning. And Barry has a few uh, copies of that document if anybody wants to take it home. Um, the first principle that we commit to in that is, is reconciliation, which we believe absolutely has to be a guiding force in building a new Ireland. And yes, reconciliation is both a term um, that will need a lot more definition, having become almost a cliche in 25 years of, of gesture swapping um, in, in, in Northern Ireland since the Good Friday Agreement. Most of us agree that Northern Ireland remains a very divided society. The peace process brought an end uh, mostly to violent conflict and the agreement brought political institutions that were designed to accommodate and respect uh, differences while hopefully reducing our sense of division. And though there have been many, many positive ways in which our society has become less divided, it would be naive to pretend that ours is a reconciled place, reconciled either to the past or to the future or even just to the complicated presence uh, of living in Northern Ireland. Nor can we honestly say that we've reached a point where the two uh, parts of this island and the different traditions that share this island know and understand each other. Despite the undeniable progress we've made since the agreement, everyday friction gives us all endless opportunities to see and think the worst of each other in Northern Ireland, to set each other's teeth on edge and to reinforce any of the old stereotypes um, that we have in mind. And that might be one of the reasons why the most common, uh, one of the most common objections to talking about constitutional change comes from those who say sincerely, say that we haven't yet completed the work of reconciliation, that therefore we're simply not ready to have these conversations. Um, our party, the SDLP, is, I, I feel I can genuinely say, more committed than any other to ending division in the North. We're not just trying to create a new tribe of other to, to rival that of nationalist and, and unionist. We're trying to uh, erode those divisions. So we take it very, very seriously when people suggest that talking about constitutional change is a barrier to reconciliation, that it might set the region back, that it's better to keep uh, a lid on all that. We take it very seriously, but we respectfully disagree. We believe that the process of having this conversation and of building something new for this island, in fact, shaping something new that's already building itself and in, in fields like culture and, and, and in business, needn't be a barrier to reconciliation. It will itself be a process of reconciliation. So I want to come back to the question I asked earlier, what do we mean by reconciliation? If it means anything, it has to mean not an event or even a process, but a way of living and a way of approaching the predicament of living in a place with a complex, uneven history that's littered with trauma and injustice. It means understanding, it means accepting, and to us, crucially, it means empathy. Maybe it means looking uh, where we can for the best in each other and not always assuming the worst, understanding where somebody is coming from, even if you don't agree in the slightest, acknowledging the things that have shaped that view for them. Exercising that choice can be a challenge, not least when, uh, when media, social media, and sometimes traditional media tempt us into reaction, often overreaction, when we see the demonstrations of insensitive insensitivity and lack of empathy that are almost every day uh, in the North, the flags, the chants, the commemorations, the desecrations. It takes a lot of effort not to leap to offence or to the worst conclusions about each other, but it also takes uh, a lot of effort uh, to pause and consider how our words or our actions might be taken by others and not to just hop on the everyday uh, merry-go-round of, of, of commentating and, and, and condemnation that passes for politics uh, in the North a lot of the time. That all requires empathy. 
that's a particular burden we believe in those of us who seek to build a new and inclusive Ireland and one that the SDLP has been serious about for, for the decades of our existence. We've put ourselves in difficult places. We'll be at the Cenotaph uh, this Sunday. We were at um, difficult events for us commemorating partition last year. We're in Westminster um, every week in places um, that aren't necessarily the most comfortable for us, but that um, allow us to say our experience and our interpretations aren't all the same, but we know they're all part of this island's story. There were opportunities not taken for sure in the post Good Friday Agreement years and for, for various reasons and in various ways we failed to create a context where we can reconcile, where we can empathise with each other. Many hundreds of thousands of people in the North do that every day, unionists and, and nationalists and neither, but the politics do not encourage it. And so those that say talking about the future constitution is incompatible with or damaging to reconciliation, they have to be asked why, if our current arrangements uh, are more likely to facilitate at healing and reconciliation. Why is that not happening uh, to date? There's really no more logic um, to that position uh, beyond change is challenging, but like it or not, uh, relationships are changing in, in the North, not, uh, not least through Brexit. I can't believe I got five minutes in be without mentioning the B word, but, um, but there it is. Uh, we need to be past the position where uh, the view that advancing constitutional change is implicitly or explicitly um, subversive uh, and destabilizing. Um, if that's the case, what is stabilizing? So we have a particular obligation to show in word and deed that new, the new Ireland we talk about and advocate for is one where reconciliation isn't just a cliche, but a founding principle and a way of living. That doesn't mean complete agreement on the past. It doesn't mean complete agreement on the future either. But what it does mean, what it doesn't mean is you have your narrative uh, and we'll have ours. You sing your song uh, and we'll sing ours. Thinking that way has absolved many in the north of that duty of empathy and at its worst, it's allowed for a trivialization of the past and present trauma. Paratrooper flags worn as capes and dairy of up the raw headbands worn uh, at gigs. And none of that is appropriate for a New Ireland. One reason why for most of its history, Northern Ireland struggled with winning the consent of the nationalist population was that few, if any, unionist politicians seemed to feel a duty of empathy to the minority that was created when that jurisdiction was. And we are very clear that we have no interest in just reversing that mistake 100 years on, just flipping partition and trapping a large minority that are unhappy uh, with where they are. The late David Trimble, all of his life a convinced unionist, used his Nobel lecture to give an account of the experience of non-unionists in the northern state. It was, he said, a cold house for Catholics. Those words represented a small but important moment of empathy, of looking at the past from someone else's point of view without conceding any point of principle. The task for those of us who want constitutional change is to explain how we have a broad vision for the future in which non-nationalists are included and integral. That's why we place reconciliation and the duty of empathy at the heart of our work and at the top of our list of core principles that will guide us for the next years. Being guided by reconciliation leads appropriately to the next core principle I want to talk about, which is embracing our diversity, another word that's absolutely swamped in platitudes, but it's core to everything that we want to build. I proudly represent South Belfast, one of the most diverse pockets of people on this uh, whole island. The number of people living in the north who um, have origins outside the UK and Ireland has doubled between 2001 and the census of 2021, although we still lag well behind Britain and the rest of the island. I and my party are unashamedly supportive of migrant communities on both sides of the border, but also of the good that a more diverse and inclusive Ireland has done for us. More diversity on the island frees us to think more creatively and generously about what we mean when we say the word Ireland and who we mean when we talk about the Irish. The achievement of winning independence for most of the island was followed by what nearly everybody now accepts was the development of a state that was too conservative and too narrow in its concept of what Ireland and Irishness should mean. But there's been a transformation, as we see it, for, uh, on the other, south of the border, not just in terms of, of economic performance, but from a monocultural society to a multifaceted European society, comfortable with the pluralism that comes from immigration and comfortable with the expansion of the concept of who 
uh, can be Irish, what rights a republic should guarantee and where citizens have supported those rights by referenda and acclaim. It's far from perfect, but it's worth acknowledging how far the republic has come in expanding its concepts of who belongs. You can understand then how jealously many in the North look on when rights for women, for LGBT communities, for ethnic minorities have all been vetoed by things like the Petition of Concern. And you can understand how artificial the constraints that allow that to happen feel to people. I expect we might pick up in questions and answers the idea of amendments to the standing orders um, of the Good Friday Agreement, Strand 1 institutions, in order to reduce vetoes, which my party fully supports. But we'll also talk about the limitations of that policy. A big challenge for those of us who seek to build a new inclusive Ireland is whether we can take the next and more challenging step of imagining a state that doesn't just uh, accommodate but encompasses and celebrates uh, particularly the British and Unionist tradition. Yes, achieving that is going to be a lot harder than aspiring to it, but we're out there and we're trying it. Earlier this year, um, the SDLP held a New Ireland Commission workshop with 60 women through Shankle Women's Centre, 60 women from, from the Shankle Road um, in Belfast who came, who engaged, who talked about to us. They didn't, we weren't pushing all at open doors, but 100% of those women um, in an evaluation forum said that they would talk to us again, said that they would participate in a workshop like that again. The Good Friday Agreement provides a model for us, uh, what we call in that document a foundation stone, esteeming as it does the equal legitimacy of British and Irish identities inside Northern Ireland, and of course, the equal legitimacy of conserving the status quo and the union and of building something new. So there's a legitimate debate about whether Northern Ireland, has it, as it is now, has truly delivered on the pluralist vision of the agreement and how a new Ireland can do better with that. We should be honest about the kind of change we're going to have to navigate over the next few years to make that happen without rehashing uh, centuries of history, although we all love to do that. Um, it's true that for, for very large parts of Irish nationalism, um, they've seen the role as winning self-government and then independence and building a nation that is distinct from Britain and Britishness. For some and not all, being not British is a big uh, part of their uh, identity, but we're committed to a pluralist ideal of society that truly encompasses the continued presence of a large part of the British nation on this island and specifically a large number of people with continuing uh, affinity to Britain. Inevitably that's going to mean conversations about flags and emblems and anthems but beyond that it is going to mean those of us advocating change thinking creatively about how we see that continuing uh, future for Britishness and our relationship um, between the new Ireland and the island next door. It isn't enough to say that the legal fact of the agreement and its citizenships takes care of that question. It hasn't been that straightforward for the vindication of the Irish identity um, in the North, but it sets down principles and promises that we genuinely need to put into practice. For example, could an enhanced partnership between a new uh, Ireland uh, act as a guarantor for continuing uh, rights of British citizens? Could a new body explore mutual interest areas of trade, migration and environment? They are not properly provided for um, in the institutions that we have. Discussing the need for continued partnership isn't just about practical cooperation, but also demonstrating that we take seriously that commitment uh, to partnership, that we celebrate and want to preserve uh, those bonds, that we're not just trying to kick the soil of Britishness off our shoes as quickly as we can. If we're serious about embracing diversity as a core principle, we need to be able to reassure British people uh, in the North that things are precious to them will still exist and be esteemed in a new Ireland. But we should also be very, and, and this is something to look forward to, the things that we celebrate as Britishness aren't just monarchy and military, although that's often, I must say, what is served up um, and, and maybe one of the reasons people like myself don't feel a strong uh, affinity to Britain and Britishness, but it's also the BBC, it's Glastonbury, it's decades and centuries of, of art um, and literature that does mean a lot uh, to, 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 to people. And for many people, many Irish people, North and South, Britain represents a place of tolerance, a place of refuge, a place where they were able to go uh, and build a better life. It represents social democracy to many people um, at a time when this uh, island didn't. None of our commitment to inclusive symbols pretends that after a successful vote for a new Ireland, nothing will change. Of course it will, or else why would we be going um, to all this trouble? But making diversity a core principle of the new Ireland isn't just an ethical fulfilment of the Good Friday Agreement. We believe that is a practical way um, to build a substantial and a sustainable coalition for change.
diversity doesn't just mean finding structures to accommodate British Britishness. It means reflecting on what we mean when we talk about Irishness. It means making those terms encompass uh, concept encompass the British identity, but also the Northern identity, which, like every region on this island, is different uh, to to the others. John Hewitt famously talked about his own multiple layers of identity. He was European, British, he was Irish, and of Ulster. Remove one, he said, and you reduce the others. Many of us share uh, that mix of identities, even if not quite in the same uh, order or weighting as as Hewitt. The advantage of EU membership was that it allowed for those multiple levels of identity. Uh, of affinity it allowed for complexity and that's why the SDLP for all these decades has been so fundamentally uh, committed and protected to the European dimension. So whatever happens the north of this island is going to remain a, a complicated place but we want to turn that complexity and um, that that sometimes that ability for critical thought into a positive for the whole island. So when we talk about diversity we don't just mean diversity of identity uh, or, or creed, but of opinion and perspective. And if there's something uh, we Nordies can agree about ourselves is that we do have a distinctive voice and we like to use it uh, quite loudly. And as well as the, I suppose, the movements you'd be aware of and the green and the orange, we have had genuine moments of uh, radical progressivism, the Enlightenment Presbyterian intellectuals of Belfast, so prominent in the United Irishmen, various manifestations of the Belfast labor movement, and of course, the civil rights movement, all of which the SDLP draw our DNA from. Ireland at its most inclusive means drawing strength from diversity. We don't want in this conversation, the North to be a pathetic and begging uh, orphan wanting to be taken in um, by the South. We have uh, values and attributes and we believe that fiery uh, Belfast and, 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 and Northern Drive can be a big part of the debate and sometimes the dissent and the things that we're going to need to create the parts of a new Ireland um, that are genuinely uh, new. That radical lineage uh, brings me to our third principle and one Again, it sounds simple, but I'm going to explain how much we mean it, is that nobody on the island should be left behind. It's going to be no surprise that a party like ours with roots in civil rights and labour politics seeks change, not just for regions of identity, and certainly not so that uh, one group can claim a victory over the other. We've always believed in the transformative power of people um, in pursuit of better, more fulfilled lives, a healthier population where more people can meet their potential. That's why we mourn the absence of devolution that we've had for so many of the last six or seven years. That's why we fought so hard to have devolution and have a place where people um, can, in theory, meaningfully change lives. But 25 years after the agreement, it would be a lie if we said that we are close to achieving those things with the, the arrangements we have now. While the post-98 generations have grown up mostly, mostly without the scourge of violence, we haven't really transformed life chances uh, through the opportunities that came to us through the agreement and devolution. Of course, the economy has grown significantly since um, 1998, but it hasn't meaningfully closed the gap in GDP per head with the UK uh, average, and it has fallen very sharply behind uh, the South, and it hasn't found ways to seize the opportunities um, that have been there. Productivity is consistently the lowest in these islands, and that's partly a reflection of the large numbers of people leaving uh, school with no qualifications relative um, to the Republic and the much lower proportion of further and higher and technical qualifications. As research from the ESRI has shown, it's in part because um, the relatively small layer of top achieving school leavers are followed by a shamefully long tail of people who leave school without any qualifications. They're quite literally being left behind as high achieving young people very often uh, move across the water um, or elsewhere uh, to find work after they graduate. And all of that means we repeat the vicious cycle of failing to educate enough of our young people, exporting a portion of those uh, we do academic investing maybe a quarter of a million pounds in each young person's primary and post-primary education and then sending them to London to build uh, to build their uh, industries and their uh, economy. And as well as that brain drain, we do have a reasonableness drain, many of the people who would who would think critically about what they're finding um, politically uh, leave and, and, and set up their lives elsewhere. And all of that prevents us from attracting enough well-paid jobs. I don't list these statistics to score points. Uh, and of course, they don't ipso facto prove that things would be different um, in a new Ireland, but the Republic we know does perform strike better, uh, around 40% higher on wages and productivity than the North. 
skeptics of these arguments will point out that there's many areas outside Dublin that don't see um, that level of prosperity. But many of those are in border regions, which vindicates um, the point that that it's not just the north where people are suffering um, from the illogical uh, nature of the border and, and not just the north that would benefit um, from working to overcome some of those artificial divisions. So our vision for leaving nobody behind is about addressing the persistent injustice of low achievement and low ambition. And we know that despite the progress in the south, many younger citizens are frustrated about particularly the cost of housing and the sense that the economy isn't being run for them and for their future. Building a new Ireland, the process of thinking about who we are uh, and what we want is an opportunity to really set priorities for the rest of the century for all of us on things like climate and things like AI on things like uh, how, handling an aging population and to design a society that prevents, presents a real opportunity uh, for a decent, uh, a decent life and decent work and the best public services. That process of renewal and, and creation for the whole Ireland uh, is our fifth uh, principle that that what we do uh, will be led by citizens and we genuinely think that's a way to reconnect uh, people in politics in, in a way that every region including the, the whole of the south um, needs. When was the last time you heard a serious discussion though in Northern Ireland about our long-term future? I don't even mean our constitutional future, I mean what things are going to look like in 2030 or 2040 or 2050. It never happens. Uh, it's more than a decade since we've had an agreed programme for government. We know uh, we don't have a government to create that plan. Politics is truly stuck in a literal and metaphorical sense and, and no party and no group of politicians has done more to prevent that um, from being the case, but it's true. Um, the past invades the present and the future uh, never arrive. So being future focused and outward looking um, is our next core principle. Uh, neither jurisdiction on the island has a defensible record uh, when it comes to climate change and neither is on course to meet um, its obligation in this crucial um, policy area. But you can't expect farmers in Monaghan to be part of an ambitious transition, but not farmers in Fermanagh. It simply won't work environmentally uh, and, and it's unfair. So this New Ireland process, as I say, isn't about those battles of the past. It's about the practical challenges of the future um, for all of us and the opportunities that uh, arrive. Even if the Assembly was up and running, we don't believe the Strand 2 institutions, even if they were allowed to work and they haven't properly done really at any serious point in the last 25 years, we don't believe they're adequate to deal with those many, many issues that transcend the border that are so much further and deeper on than we were when we designed the Good Friday Agreement, which is brilliant in principle, but it is a an analog agreement for a digital age uh, and the needs of, of running this island in any meaningful way have changed uh, quite dramatically. So as well as being resolutely focused on the future, the effort to build a new Ireland must be outward looking and internationalist. We're proud to be the most pro-European party in the North and determined that young people, workers and businesses get the huge advantages of re-entering um, the European Union. And, and, it, and it is a challenge to other parties who say that they're pro-European in the North. To be honest, that the only meaningful way uh, for, for Northern Ireland to get back into the EU is going to be um, through a new Ireland. So it is by definition, not a narrow nationalist project, uh, but an internationalist one. That's going to involve reconciling not just the identities uh, in both parts of, 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 of Ireland, but the establishment of that close partnership um, with the UK. So this work has to be based on hope for the future, something that is very, very missing. There's an absence of hope um, for many reasons in the North beyond the hope um, that we might just with DUP conversion or a negotiation um, get to have more storming forever and ever. And that unfortunately does not make the heart sing of many people who are interested in a long term better life um, in Northern Ireland. And it doesn't explain just getting back into storm and it doesn't explain how we're going to make things different than the stop start dysfunction that we've had for the last uh, quarter of a century. We're going to be honest with you today and and over the next few years that we don't have all the answers right now and that is our sixth principle hope with honesty. Much work is being done on a, on a piecemeal but an ongoing basis largely um, academic about how our respective economies and public services work right now but also how they don't work. For many years it was argued that the NHS was going to be the prohibitor of, of constitutional change because people uh, wouldn't give that up. 
the NHS at the moment for many people in the north is the right to join a waiting list, and, and many people don't see it uh, much, much, much beyond that. We 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 look at things like we look at we look at the principles of the the health service in the north, and we look at the possibilities and the functionality of the health service in the south, and we believe that something new can be bigger and better than the sum of its parts, and that's something we want to be part of. Uh, creating. It's important that we understand the complexity of managing change on that scale and that we're honest about them. We're not repeating the Brexit mistake of pushing through change based on glib distortions. Um, but what does hope with honesty mean in this context? There's a very live debate among economists about uh, the subvention in the North, how that is calculated, which is relevant because the different forms of, of spending um, are different uh, for different parts of the UK and things like defence and diplomatic spending that are that are allocated in the in the um in the uh in in the block grant um uh, being an obvious example but whatever figure is chosen we're not um pretending that northern ireland is substantially uh subvented it is in fiscal deficit uh, and it will be for many years to come but it is also honest to acknowledge that that is itself a symbol uh, of the failure yes regions will always be supported uh by capitals but if that is all the ambition that we're allowed to have for our economy that we get to just maybe have a bit more control on spending um, the pocket money that we have, we don't believe um, that is uh, that is sufficient. So it's entirely legitimate in conclusion that those who want the status quo to continue, it's entirely legitimate that they uh, claim that fiscal transfer is the reason, but it's equally legitimate for those of us uh, who want change to say that we can and will chart a path to better. It hasn't been a, a, an easy few years for the political tradition I represent, New Irelanders who are anti-sectarian and who are serious about government and serious about the economy. Um, with my colleagues, most notably Matthew O'Toole, whose work I've drawn on very heavily here, we're, we're hopeful and we are, for the first time in years, excited actually uh, about what's ahead. We sincerely believe that the time is now to move into a, a, a phase of applied thinking uh, about how do we tackle tackle those three divisions and that's what I want to leave you with there are three multi-layered complex divisions they are sectarianism in in various parts of our society they are inequality um between uh, economic inequality and they are uh, borderism on this island we don't believe um they can be tackled one by one we don't believe any other movement or party is serious about each of the three of them others um dip in to, to one or two we want to work on that and we want to work um with all of you to do so thank you very much 